Let's continue. Returning to the main story, when Sancho finds himself obliged and in need of doing what no other could do for him, he pulls down his breeches until they became like manacles, and he does what he has to do. Like the vomit scenes of chapter 17 and 18, here Sancho's faces, the noises he makes, the smells, as well as Don Quixote's reaction are comical. When Sancho's flatulence reaches Don Quixote's nostrils, he came to their rescue by pinching them between two fingers, and with a twangy tone he said, it seems to me, Sancho, that you are very much afraid. Now let's look at the contentious outcome of the adventure. Notice how, after many recent uncomfortable physical exchanges between master and servant, their professional relationship becomes an issue. At dawn, Sancho has to unleash Rocinante. When Don Quixote learns that Rocinante is free to move, he prepares for the adventure. First, he reiterates everything Sancho should tell Dulcinea, but then the narrator adds something very interesting. As for what pertained to the payment of his services, he was not to worry, because before he had left home, he had arranged his will, in which he would find himself fully satisfied in regards to his salary, which would be prorated according to the amount of time served. So Don Quixote clearly has in mind a prorated daily salary for Sancho. Sancho protests again, but eventually he decides to accompany his master, taking, as was his custom, by the halter, his ass, that perpetual companion of his prosperous and adverse fortunes. Curiously, the second narrator tells us that the original author, supposedly Cide Ametti, notes that the concern that Sancho has for the welfare of his master suggests that the squire must have been well-born, and at the very least, of old Christian stock. Namely, that he must not have Moors and Jews as ancestors. I say curiously because this emphasis on blood purity contrasts with Sancho's scatological filth. What's more, all respect and concern between knight and squire cease when we finally discover that the source of the noise, which had them in suspense and fear all night, are six fulling hammers, a type of hydraulic machine used to clean and thicken wool. Note that these machines were introduced to Europe via Islamic Spain. The subsequent exchange between Don Quixote and Sancho is at first rather touching. Sancho looked at him and saw that he had his head bent over his chest with signs of great shame. Don Quixote looked at Sancho too and saw that his cheeks were swollen as his mouth fought to restrain his laughter although with obvious signs of wanting to let go. And in the end, at the sight of Sancho, his melancholy gave way and he could not help but laugh. Another important case of laughter. Notice, however, that this laughter turns violent in a way related to social hierarchy. When Sancho mocks Don Quixote, imitating his chivalric jargon, I am he for whom are reserved great perils, mighty deeds, and valiant feats. His master's reaction, according to the narrator, poses a threat to Sancho's wages. Don Quixote became so enraged and angry that he raised his pike and delivered two such blows that if he had received them on his head instead of his back, his master would have been released from the obligation of paying his salary, unless it was to his heirs. Legalistic, contractual, and labor issues would seem to be the point of the episode's conclusion. At the very least, this is a fantastic description of the disintegration of traditional feudal relations throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. What replaces those more organic relations is a new system of relatively impersonal payments, according to the bourgeois marketplace. Notice how Cervantes stresses that everything depends on the point of view of the characters. And there are even some inconsistencies here. Don Quixote insists on a certain respectful formalism. In other words, Sancho should not make fun of his master, for not all people have enough understanding such that they can look beyond such lapses in etiquette. But Don Quixote is also trying to reassert traditional socioeconomic relations, although not completely. From everything I've told you, Sancho, you should infer that it is necessary to maintain a distinction between servant and lord, between squire and knight. The favors and benefits that I have promised you will arrive in due time. 
And if they do not, at least your salary will not be lost, as I have already stated. Note that it is Don Quixote who first brings up the issue of wages. For his part, at first Sancho seems willing to forgive what just happened and accept their feudal relationship once again. Soon, however, it is clear that he is still trying to assess the value of his services. Usually, highborn gentlemen, after overly harsh words to a servant, then give him a pair of breeches, although I don't know what they give him after giving him a beating. Notice the wonderfully artistic context of this. Cervantes relates a discussion between Sancho and Don Quixote regarding breeches and beatings, while at the same time fulling hammers are pounding away in the most violent step of textile production. In other words, their dialogue regarding salary is synchronized with the first inklings of the Industrial Revolution. And it seems that the more Sancho thinks about this situation, the more doubts he has. All that your worship says is fair enough, but I would like to know, in case the favors never actually arrive and we are forced to consider wages, just how much a squire made from a knight errant in those days, and if they were paid on a monthly basis, or daily, like bricklayers. Don Quixote, clinging to his old world view, rejects the idea. I do not think that such squires ever received wages, but favors adding that after parents, masters must be respected as if they were forefathers. This is all very strange. Don Quixote already said he had arranged for Sancho's prorated salary in his will. Now he argues that squires were never paid according to salaries. Is he crazy? Is he forgetful? Is he acting? Or is he perhaps negotiating? Let's review. The encounter with the dead body and the matter of whether or not metaphysical phantoms, devils, and satans actually exist gives way to an endless story of jealousy between a shepherd and a somewhat mannish shepherdess, a story that is told in the context of a degree of bodily intimacy between master and servant that is to say the very least uncomfortable, difficult to contemplate. This all ends, however, in a mundane and detailed discussion about the appropriate compensation for a medieval squire in the pre-industrial world of machines and mass production. Sometimes it's very hard to laugh at Cervantes's jokes and at the same time marvel at the complexity of his narrative. It's like watching a thermodynamic Rube Goldberg machine go through its many processes. Incidentally, this is the second mill in the novel and it will not be the last. Oh, and we almost forgot to point out the curious comment made by Cide Amete regarding Sancho's ethnic and religious purity. I guess the unavoidable question here is whether or not all of these elements are just randomly related by Cervantes' meandering but essentially purposeless creativity. You probably already know what I think. What do you think? <laughs>